All right, well, good morning, Crossroads, and uh, thank you all for coming. Those of you who came to support those getting baptized today, uh, what a phenomenal day for three individuals who got to publicly proclaim uh, that they have asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. Well, for the rest, um, we are in the middle of a series called Life on Mission, and, and we're in week three of this. And so in week one, I talked about the concept of that we only have one job, and that one job is to witness. And that's usually the results you get. That's our job. We've only got one job, and that's to witness. And then last week, I I talked about a concept that could help us be a a better witness by this uh, term, connecting you know, that we need to establish relationships with people because they're more likely to listen to what we have to say if we've got some kind of a relationship. You know, it's kind of awkward if you catch somebody and, and, and you just like the first words out of your mouth are, uh, do you know where you'll spend eternity? <laughs> now, 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 don't get me wrong. If that's the Holy Spirit telling you to do that, you move out. But I also want you to know that... Um, Life happens in more than just one encounter. And so it's important for us to establish relationships because when you have a relationship, you'll be able to ask that question and you'll probably get an answer. Whereas the, uh, the other way, you get the door shut, you, the car pulls off, or you know, they move out in the, the shopping center. Well, this week, I want to tell you about the, the next concept of helping us be a witness, and that is the concept of serve. And I, and I think about our church, and I think of a church that serves. You know, we are not just a Sunday church. Uh, we are a church seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and, and we are staying busy. I think uh, just three weeks ago, um, I uh, got a call from uh, Plaza Verde, and they said, hey, we've got a, a gentleman who needs to uh, get to a veteran's appointment down in Marion, and um, I was told that if, you know, if we reached out, you guys would probably find somebody. I said, give me an hour, knowing my church. I put it out there, and uh, within an hour, we reached back out. We had somebody, and um, a, a mom and her daughter got to bless uh, this veteran and, and take them down to Marion, um, help them get to this appointment on time and get the things that they need to be done, and they established a relationship. You know, um, I think about uh, the last week and then just this past um, Wednesday night, uh, we've delivered, uh, I think it was five beds over those, those two uh, times. And I remember seeing the picture from last week, and there were the Hicksons and the Tellefsons with the Tellefsons' two little girls um, in one of the, the houses where they had just delivered uh, a bed. You know, yesterday, we had a group that was uh, part of uh, Mission Centralia uh, building a ramp for um, a gentleman that is in advanced stages of cancer and needed some help. And not only that, but then yesterday, there was a group here at the church um, through the Illinois Baptist uh, Disaster Relief Program. They had delivered a semi a truck full of uh, food, and we had the opportunity to bless 24 different families um, through, through members of our church. You see, um, serving is critical. Serving is important for us. Serving is what we need to be doing. And so uh, Josh started today by asking you to be here you know, and I've challenged you, uh, be here for these five weeks. If you're just getting here in week three, I'm here to tell you, be here for the next two weeks because these are the foundation that we as Christ followers need to build our life if we want to do that one job well, and that is be a witness. And then you just heard uh, Josh Tellison talk to you about being involved and, and, you know, not just in the service projects, but man, one of the best places that you can get involved is in life group. Life happens in a life group. I won't call anyone's name out, but on Wednesday, um, I encountered one of uh, our, our church members, and, and she had gone to the ladies' group, and, um, and she said, Ronnie, you know, um, I, you know, we would never talk about the things that they were talking about. We would never reveal um, our past like they were doing on Tuesday nights. And I said, well, that's the difference between Sunday school and life group. 
You know, I love Sunday school. There's nothing wrong with Sunday school. But here's the problem in Sunday school, you know, we think it's a one direction. The teacher gets up there and, and teaches to us. What we find out is in life group, what happens is you find out you're not the only person going through that crisis. You'll find out you're not the only person to have experienced that horrible experience. You find out that not only are you not the only one, but there's somebody who's been there, done that, and by the grace of God, they're living victoriously. That's why you'll hear me talk about life group. Well, I want to kind of share with you how um, Jesus talked about the, the concept of serving. And you find this in the, book of, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Luke, chapter 10. And I want you to know, if you're here today and you do not have a copy of God's Word, if you look in front of you, uh, there should be a seat that has a Bible. And if you'll open that up, there's a message in there. And if you don't own a copy of God's Word, we want you to take that one. We want you to put your name in it. And we want you to make that your copy because we believe that everybody should have a copy of God's Word. See, you can't build on that, the, the foundation, that rock, of God's word if you're not reading it, if you're not hearing it, if, if you're not putting this as part of your life. And so that's why we make that available to you, and I hope that you'll take us up on that. If you um, have one of those Bibles and you find page 1066, that's Luke chapter 10 and where I'm going to start reading in verse 25. In verse 25, it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is it written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But this lawyer said and, and, and the Bible tells us he was desiring to justify himself. He said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You see, the uh, lawyer had the right head knowledge. Jesus asked him, um, he turned the question back on him. You asked me, what should I do to have eternal life? He says, well, what does the law say? And the law says to love God and to love people. And what we know is you cannot possibly love God if you don't love God people. See, we tell ourselves, man, it's easy to love God. But sometimes people aren't the easiest to love. Sometimes people are evil. Sometimes people are foolish. Sometimes people hurt us. But that doesn't change the requirement. And the requirement this is this. If you want eternal life, then you have to love God and love people perfectly. So this lawyer, being a lawyer, he, he tries to get Jesus with a gotcha question. Have you ran into those folks at work? <laughs> Have you seen those people at the family reunion? Like they know the Bible better than you. And they ask you a gotcha question. I'm going to trick them. I can't wait to see Ryan. And they hit you with that question. This is what this lawyer did. He hit Jesus with a gotcha question. And he said, who's my neighbor? You know, it's interesting that Jesus, the way that he answered the question was with a story. And so when this lawyer brings up barriers because he answered his own question to love God and love people, but yet he, the, the reality was that this lawyer had people that he didn't want to love. There's, there's no other way to say it. And, and the reality is that as Christ followers, there are probably people that we come across that we don't want to love. We're like, come on, God, this, I know you didn't mean that person. And yet he did. You know, I've been telling you about this term called gracist. You know, it's not about the color of our skin. It's about the color of our sin. And somehow in the church, we have found out there's a line. And if your sins are below that line, well, my goodness, there's no way you're getting to heaven. You're not going to experience eternal life. 
And for some reason, we've never done any of those sins, and that makes us more worthy of the Father. And really, all we are is a gracious in that we think that God's grace is good enough for us and our sins, but not good enough for the worst. We're not, not good enough for somebody worse than us. So let's hear what Jesus said to this guy who's trying to trick him. In verse 30, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, I don't know exactly how dead half dead is, but it doesn't sound good. And it surely doesn't sound good when you're on a road all by yourself, maybe in a boat all by yourself. Half dead is not a good, I, I, I'm pretty sure. And so here's this guy left half dead. And, and then verse 31, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds and poured out oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and uh, whatever you more you spend, I will repay when I come back. And what happens is um, we find out that when there's an opportunity for us to serve, we put up barriers. I want to kind of tell you this story just a little differently. You, you've heard God's word, but let me give you a, a, a newer version. Let me give you the, the Ronology edition. In the Ronology edition, this story goes like this. A Crossroads Church Christ follower was going through Walmart. And he broke down, and some thugs came out and beat him and left him half dead. And then Pastor Ronnie was driving through Walmart. And he saw the car, and he could see that it had been the windows smashed, and, and he might or might not have been somebody in there. And he went on the other side and went around because he had somebody to visit in church. And then a few hours later, Deacon Gary drives by, and Deacon Gary kind of looks in there, and he sees that it looks like he's not just half dead, he's whole dead. And he needed to get to the church, and so he passed by on the other side. And then a transgender was passing by, and he saw, he pulled his car over, he got out, he helped him out of his car, into his, took him to St. Mary's Hospital, and offered to pay all the bills that needed to happen. Now, I want you to think about that story, and, and I want you to think about it from this perspective, is that's you. You're the one who got robbed. You're the one who got beaten. You're the one who got left half dead. Because that's what Jesus was really saying. He was telling the, the Jews that were asking him, he said, a Jew went from Jerusalem and he got beat up. And now you are probably familiar with this story as the Good Samaritan. And nobody ever called them Good Samaritans. That's something in our Western culture. Matter of fact, what the, the Jews called them was evil. The Jews called them dogs. Matter of fact, these same Pharisees accused Jesus of being a Samaritan. So Jesus turns the table on him. And he tells the story, and it was the dog. It was the person that we want to reject. He 
It's a person that we think is unworthy of God. But at the conclusion of this story in verse 36, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and you do likewise. Let me ask you, which person that helped out the Crossroads Church Christ follower that got beat up and left for half dead in Walmack, who was his neighbor? Was it Pastor Ronnie? Nope. Was it Deacon Gary? Nope. Was it the transgender? Let me share with you a couple of lessons and that we can learn from, from this story. Number one, this story is not real. There wasn't a guy that got beat up. A priest did not walk by and, and pass him on. A Levite didn't walk by and pass him on the other side. The only thing that was real about that story was Jesus telling it and that there was a lawyer that he was talking to. Uh, and, and let me assure you that um, none of you that I'm aware of have uh, broken down and gotten beaten up in Walmart. Maybe a couple years ago <laughs> when you were a teenager out at 2 a.m., but to my knowledge, none of you have that has happened to you. And, and to my knowledge, I didn't drive by on the other side. And to my knowledge, I know Deacon Gary would never do that. But that story's not real either. But here's what is real. Religious people like to feel justified. There's something about... It, that religious people want to get justified in their actions. When we're mean to people and, and someone who's never been to church a day in their life say, well, doesn't the Bible say you're supposed to love? And then we, well, it also, Jesus threw over the tables. We'll find it in the scripture. And trust me, whatever you want, you'll find here. There's a bunch of different religions based off of the same book. But the reality is that we as Christians, we get stuck in gracism and we justify our bad actions are not like Christ actions. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is this, that sometimes bad theology equals better neighbors. And the reality is this, and I guarantee you that you know what I'm talking about, that there's people out there that have never stepped foot in church according to that, that you know, but you know that they are some of the nicest people. They're the ones who will stop and help you when you're broken down. They're the ones who will bring their tractor over when you need something done at your house. They're the ones who will give up everything to come and help you, but yet they've never been to church. And you don't understand that, but yet they're just like that. And, and what happens is these people, when they're wealthy, they get involved in philanthropy where they go and they take that wealth and they use it to help people. And, and I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with that. That is a great thing. But sometimes bad theology beats us as neighbors. Sometimes bad theology does a better job of loving people than we do as Christ followers. Another lesson is this, that we need to really see people. You see, the priest, based on Jesus' story, really didn't see that person. What he saw was that he was going to be delayed. What he saw was that he probably couldn't help him out. What he saw was somebody beyond his help. And so he went around and he kept going on his journey. He was more focused on where he needed to go than the person that God had put in his path. And I wonder how many times we're guilty of that. I wonder how many times that we get so focused on getting here to church, on doing something for God, and we pass somebody. We get that phone call from a, a family member that needs us, and we say, I'd love to help you, but I'm on my way to church. 
I wonder. See, we need to see people, really see them, really see where they are at. We need to be able to see people the way God sees people. Because based on the story, Jesus said, what must I do to be saved? Or the, the, the rich young ruler said that. And Jesus answered to love God and love people. That, you're right. That, that's the, the, let me ask, did the priest love God and love people? Well, he was attempting to love God, but he missed it with the love people person part. Did the Levite love God and love people? He failed miserably. And he might have had good reason because if he would have touched the dead body, he wouldn't have been able to uh, worship in the temple for uh, seven days. And maybe it was his rotation to be in the temple. Here's what I want you to know. That that story is not about serving. That story isn't one to guilt you into doing a better job of helping your neighbor. We should do that because we're Christ followers. That story was about one thing, and that is the question at the beginning of the chapter. Matter of fact, that story was about one thing. It was about what's on my T-shirt. I don't know if you can see that born squared. That means born again. And the verse there is John 3, 7, where Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. See, the reality is that the person who was on the side of the road, needed saving. And the reality is that you and I come across people every day, all day, that need saved. And yet we're too busy. God's done it all, folks. You don't have to do anything other than be a witness. And when I say that, a lot of times we get confused. We think that when I say be a witness that that we need to pull out the Romans road or we need to to go through uh, some form or we need to be a witness because here's what's happening. People are watching you. They're watching what you do. They're watching how you behave. They're watching what you say. They're watching what you post. They're watching. And, you know, they know that, that we're supposed to love God and love people. And they're watching you to see if you love God and love people. But I want you to know this. More important than loving God and loving people is you must be born again. There is no other option. One day, every one of us, every one within the sound of my voice, everybody watching this will die. You're either going to die or you're going to be taken away. And it's interesting how that our entire nation has gone crazy over a virus that has a 99.98% chance of not killing you. But there is a 100% chance that every one of us will die, whether it's from COVID, whether it's from diabetes, whether it's from a heart issue, whether it's from a vehicle accident. Every one of us in here one day will die. And the question is, what happens then? You see, this rich, ruler, rich young ruler went to Jesus and he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And sometimes I'll say it this way, there's only two ways that you can go to heaven. And when I say that, usually um, uh, the really deep theologians in the room perk up because they know there's only one way. You see, the two ways are this, either you can live a perfect life or you can accept what Jesus Christ did. Worship team, would you come forward? Everybody else, would you stand to your feet? Jesus said these words, you must be born again. If you're in here this morning and you have never ever made that decision, if you have never 
establish that relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have only become a Christ follower in name only and not in your heart, I hope that you don't leave here today without changing that. The Bible tells us that all we have to do to be saved is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we just have to believe this crazy story that God sent his son down here to earth to live a perfect life, a life that we couldn't do. And that he got rejected by the very, the most religious people of that day. And he got crucified and killed and died on a cross. And three days later, the power of God called him out. And it's because of what he did there on the cross and, and when he rose from the dead, made it possible for a horrible guy named Ronnie Tabor to call out and ask for forgiveness and receive mercy and experience grace in a way that I could never have imagined. That same Jesus Christ, not only did he die for Ronnie Tabor, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that he died for you. The question is, will you accept that? Because I, I'm just going to get to the punch and you'll never, ever live the perfect life. I think if we're all honest, we could probably acknowledge that, you know what, you're right, Ronnie. I've messed up a couple times. Some of you a couple thousand times. But whether you messed up a couple times or a couple thousand times, Jesus Christ died for you. And here's what I would ask you. If you're here today and you've never made that decision, don't leave. I'm going to ask it this way. If, and I'm not going to ask anybody to come up here. But if, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, would you and you want to, would you raise your hand? Let me ask you another question. Maybe some of you have asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, but you've never followed in that next step, that, that believer step of baptism. That's exactly what you saw today. You saw people who had been saved but had not followed that step of baptism. And there's a whole reason why we baptize by immersion versus any other way. It's not that I'm trying to drown them. <laughs> Don't want to do that. Here's why. Because it is a picture of what happened in their heart. It's a picture where they said, I died to myself, and I accepted what Jesus did on the cross. And just like Jesus was put into the ground for three days, and then he rose again. Maybe you're here today, and you need to follow in that. What I would encourage you is if, if you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, in front of you, there's these cards, these decision cards, and fill one of those out about committing to Christ. And if, if you want to get it resolved and you want to get baptized, um, we'll do this again in a few weeks. And I want you to put your name down there and mark that, and I will reach out to you, and we'll sit down and talk. But here's the reality. You must be born again. Folks, we can make all the beds we want. We can build all the ramps. We can hand out all the food. But if we're not born again when we take this last breath, when our heart stops beating, all the ramps, all the food, all the beds mean nothing. Nothing. Why? Because what John 3, 7 says, you must be born again. I'm going to pray, and then the, the worship team is going to lead us in our, our song. Uh, join me in prayer. God, I come to you, and I thank you so much for the, the three that made the public profession of faith, Lord, the three that demonstrated what you, did, you, your son, did on the cross, spending three days in the tomb and rising again through the power of God. God, I ask blessings on each of their lives. I pray that uh, their baptism will be a testimony to their friends and their family. I pray that it would be an encouragement to them as they uh, walk their faith out. Lord, I lift up those that are here today that, God, that many, many of us, sometimes we get stuck on being justified and that we, we do so much for you, Lord, but God, it's not enough. It never will be. 
And Lord, I pray that you would help us, help us see, God, that it is you, the work that you do with us, through us, and God, it's the work that you do in our heart. Let no one leave here today. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would convict them. Let no one leave today not knowing that they've got a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So here's, here's what I, I want to just tell you about this song. All right, this is our song for Life on Mission. It's called Nobody. All right, because the reality is that each of us have to humble ourselves and become a nobody. Why? So that somebody, somebody will come to know Jesus. And they'll, they'll, they'll come to know this by our actions. See, it doesn't matter what people think about you or say about you. We've got one job. Be a witness.